concentration. And eventually these concentrations will be known as reservations. That was the whole idea of the Indian Removal Act. Of course, the tribes that survived west or east of the Mississippi River into what they called Indian Territory. And that would be the policy. At first, it was by treaty, but especially after the Battle of Old Bighorn, it became just dictated. They just simply are going to tell the tribes, you are going to the reservation, period. And that's coming. And then those who refuse to go, total war. You might think it's called economic war. That's why I put that in parentheses. And don't forget, the people who ran the United States Army after the Civil War believe they won the Civil War with those tactics. So they put forts every place along, or as many places as possible on the plains. All these things in black, those are forts. Those are forts. And then the red, those are battles. And so that stifles movement, makes it very difficult. So it's like they're always hemmed in. This is a, this is the way since time eternal to fight nomadic um, forces or those who might use guerrilla tactics. I mean, this is exactly what you're going to see time after time. It doesn't work all the time, but then the big thing is to deprive them of supplies, a conscious effort to kill as many of the bison as possible. And the bison are already really disrupted by the railroads. That first railroad came in, combined with increased hunting, so disrupted their migratory patterns that their birth rate, mm -hmm. the reproduction rate of the bison, just tanked, was already dropping off the face of the earth. So this was already a massive crisis for the bison herds. And so think, you know, General Sherman is now commanded the United States Army with Grant as president. Total war. You know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail to you. You know one tactic. And so, and General Sheridan, etc. they're the ones who did it. And so the buffalo hunters would go out, and the railroads now provided them with a way to get there and to ship back the only thing of value that would survive. Buffalo hunters could kill hundreds of buffalo at one time. Basically, all they do is kill the lead bison, and the rest of the bison would mill around. They didn't have any natural predators, at least adult bison didn't. The calves did, but the adult bison didn't. And so they just would mill around, so they could just pick them off until they ran out of ammunition. And then they would go and a horrifically awful job, but skin them, lay the pelts out to dry, come up with these bales that they would take to the railhead. This is in Dodge City, Kansas. And Kansas, this was right along the Missouri Pacific Railroad, right? In my directions, right? Right about here. And, the, and of course, you can imagine the tribes go out and try to stop them. And so the U.S. Army would go on and protect the buffalo hunters. And by the 1870s, they're providing the buffalo hunters with ammunition and even armed escorts. So this will force the tribal members onto reservations and also open up that land for farming and livestock. And so that was the plan. They did the southern herd first. So when the Transcontinental Railroad split that off, that was the first big area of fighting where the United States Army was protecting the buffalo hunters and the tribes trying to stop it. After that, by 1870s, then we get up in the year. I'm only going to pick three particular battles because of time reasons, and we just, this will give good examples of what happened, all based on this declining bison herd. And like I said, I called them buffalo a couple times. I know. They were called buffalo hunters but they were mice. And, oh, almost forgot one thing. What did they do with this? For what? Yeah, they would take this heavy, thick leather for belts for machines, the new England, the second industrial knowledge. Yeah, you might get some coats, some rough, but they're, they're not really practical for this because they're so heavy. Yeah, but the thick leather for the machines. And then after the buffalo, millions would be killed. Another type of profit would be made from it. They would gather up the bones. This was in Kansas, one of the more famous pictures of buffalo skulls piled up at a railhead. Here to ship back east to grind up into fertilizer. And that's why it's impossible to find any buffalo, or virtually impossible to find 
any kind of buffalo bones on the planes, even though you think they'd be everywhere because they gathered them all up. Bone fertilizer um, stinks. I guess that's what fertilizer does, but it's very, it's very good fertilizer. And the first example of this was actually before the transcontinental, but it's a classic example of tying it all together. Buffalo hunters, the army protected them, etc. So we have miners. The miners in Colorado. This is in Colorado. I forgot to put Colorado. So I'm going to put Colorado. Miners needed food. So hunters went out into the Cheyenne <coughs> tribe. The Cheyenne were basically here. Right here. And they're hunting grounds. So buffalo hunters went out. You can imagine the Cheyenne fought back. Well, going into the winter of 1864, it had already been known that's the time to campaign against American Indians when they're hunkered down in one spot. In the summer, the nomadic plains tribes moved way too fast for the U.S. Army, even for the U.S. the cavalry, horse soldiers. They just be gone. And so winter was the time they attacked. And so Buffalo hunters were being attacked. And think about it, 1864, in the boom town of Denver, the Civil War is going on. So there's a militia, and it's well armed because of the Civil War. The United States desperately wanted to protect the, the, the mines, and it's, I don't know, it's actually pretty far, but there was fighting in New Mexico, and the tribes in Indian Territory joined the Confederacy. So they thought it was threatened. And they used an excuse saying the Cheyenne are being equipped by the Confederacy, which was not true at all. So, militia under Colonel William Shivington. Shivington's name would become famous. He's a, a kind of failed businessman, probably drunk, <laughs> but he went out looking for fame with this well, well organized militia to find the Cheyenne. They bumbled around the plains of eastern Colorado and found nothing until they came across an encampment. Now, the encampment was called after one of their leading. Remember, the U.S. only dealt with men, so leading male leaders, Black Kettle. And Black Kettle had already signed an agreement saying they would protect buffalo hunters. His and Campbell were basically very few men of fighting age and were mostly young people and, and elderly. They were even flying an American flag. But Shivington wanted fame, couldn't find anybody else. They bumbled around in the cold. And so they attacked on the morning the late of the 29th and into the 30th. I'm sorry, the evening of the 20th, night of the 29th into the 30th. They attacked. Here is a watercolor of it. This is the site of it. It says battleground, but it's not really a battleground. Shivington ordered his men to take no prisoners, to kill everybody. And when he was personally asked, what about children? His response would become famous. Nits make lice. Nits are the lice larvae. And by calling them lice, you get the, the attitude that they had towards these people defending your life. And so they swept in and took Black Kettle totally by surprise, who was not expecting this cavalry, cavalry troops to go by to attack him because they're flying an American flag. So they weren't prepared at all. The only thing that saved hundreds of people on Black Kettle's encampment, including Black Kettle, was the fact that Shivington's men were so poorly led and they, most of them were drunk. But they still massacred as many as 200 people. And this is going to be the template for future attacks by the United States Army. Night attacks for early morning in the winter. For example, the second in command of the 7th Cavalry, five years later, would find Black Kettle's encampment again, still flying the same American flag, and this time massacred including Black Kettle. That would be under a guy named George Husky, a place called the Washita. We're not going to talk about that one. I, I got to pick. And so we got to get to another fight, that San, Cre San Crico, winter campaigns. That was the time. You think about the high plains, how cold it is, as we'll soon find out if you get some of that cold. But there's nothing to stop the wind in the Dakotas. That's when they attack. And so the Montana gold mine would actually lead to the next battle we have to talk about. They need food. They need resupply. So Bozeman Trail would be a cutoff. John Bozeman would survey a trail from the Oregon Trail up into Montana 
to Virginia City. Gee, I wonder what city is going to be named after him. And Missoula, is that one? Yeah, yeah, Missoula, yeah, obviously. And the, the United States Army, now greatly reduced in size after the Civil War, knew that this was going right through Lakota and Cheyenne and Arapaho hunting grounds. And so they built, and also Crow, and they built three forts along Bozeman Trail. And those are going to be the centers of fights as the Lakota tried to cut off the trail. And this will be known as Red Cloud's War after one of the leading Lakota warriors. <clears throat> so the Lakota, but also other tribes, but the Lakota led it, tried to cut off these trails. And there's going to be a couple massive fights. A company of U.S. cavalry under William Fetterman, there's the monument for it, were totally and decisively defeated by Lakota. But a few... A few cavalrymen and a woodcutting crew at the wagon box fight, this is the picture of that, drove off hunt or were able to fend off hundreds of attacking Cheyenne and Lakota. That's Red Cloud right there. Most of the fighting was along, right along Philfield Carn. It's it's just on the eastern edge of the Bighorn Mountains, so a really pretty area of wild. It kind of plains and it goes up in the mountains. Big Bighorn Mountains are really pretty. Well. The United States Army decided it wasn't worth it. Red Cloud won. They didn't have enough troops. Reconstruction was just starting. So the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 68 technically was a victory for the, the various tribes. Lakota were the biggie, but also other tribes that were there. But Red Cloud realized something very important, as he saw it. There seemed to be no stopping the United States. There seems to be an endless supply of people ready to take their land. And so he thought and was tricked into getting the best deal. He agreed to a reservation. And by agreeing to the reservation, that in essence was agreeing to the U.S., the U.S. government control. And that's going to have terrible repercussions down the road for the tribes. And so instead of saying this is American Indian land, he essentially agreed that this was the United States. And therefore, could lead to problems. This reservation would be huge. Basically, all of western South Dakota. And the Black Hills technically wasn't part of the, the part of the uh, reservation, but it's off limits of settlement. The Black Hills is very important to the Plains tribes. Plains tribes need long, tall pine trees for lodge bolts for their teepees. Where are you going to find them in the, in the Plains? Tribes would go, the Kiowa would go all the way from down here in northern Texas all the way to Black Hills to go get these lodge bolts. Has anyone been to the Black Hills? <clears throat> yeah, they're pretty cool, but you know why, if you've been there, if you drove there, you know why they're called black. You see the forest out in the middle, the kind of, especially if you go in like late summer, it's gray. Then there's black forest. It's really pretty. A lot of tourist traps. A lot of tourist traps. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's true, too. And because all there's thousands don't camp there. Right, yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's all part of Fort Laramie Tree. And, but it also said in the summer, or, and so on the reservation, the United States will care. They will provide food and shelter for the tribes for how long? Forever. As payment for taking their land. Forever. I don't know what forever means, but what it means is we'll carry it for you. We took your land for forever. But in the summer, you can go out to these hunting grounds in the West and hunt. And that was like the deal. But it's not their land. And it kind of it lays out this area, but too, you can imagine what the Lakota or Cheyenne thought, it's all our hunting ground. It was a trick. Well, the Black Hills, they thought they might have gold. And in 1874, they found gold there. And that would trigger the Great Sioux War. And this is the one that most Montanans know. There are two big things in Montana in this period of the Great Sioux War. I picked one of the two. It's one of those, you know, I just have to pick one. And gold was discovered in 1874. 
a detachment of, of surveyors and reporters and part of the 7th U.S. Cavalry Regiment under their second in command, George Armstrong Custer, went into the Black Hills and they found gold. And they weren't supposed to tell anybody, but Custer let it out. Custer was a publicity hound, a good commander in the Civil War, but very much a publicity hound. Well, you can imagine what's going to happen. Gold? And this is during the Panic of 1873. This triggered a gold rush. And thousands of citizens of the United States moved into the Black Hills, blatantly violating the treaty. Now, the United States government and the Grant administration has two, two uh, options. Use the United States Army to drive out those gold, um, those gold miners and those who came with the gold rush. Or force the tribes to give it up. What did they decide to do? Anybody want to guess? Which one? Yeah, they basically told the tribe, nope, they're going to stay. So they violated the treaty. But what happened was a lot of those on the reservation hated the treaty anyways. They called themselves winter wanderers. They stayed all summer and winter out here. Well, they said, told you they were lying. And so a bunch of people on the reservation joined them. That summer, or the fall, I'm sorry, the spring of 1876, they went into this bison range and they're going to stay. If you're violating the treaty, then the treaty is null and void and we're going. So they hit winter and summer wanderers, they were called. And they went into this area of Wyoming and Montana. Now, in that spring, the various groups began to come together right along here in southern Montana. And that really, it's really, it's a really pretty area because you have these kind of low mountains, pine trees. Um, doesn't rain a lot, so you get also these kind of spectacular valleys in the spring that are all green and gray because they're dry two months later. It's a really pretty area. And I like our state, so I think every, almost every place is pretty. Almost. I'm not saying Great Falls. But I'm implying. No, yeah. Those, those were the, yeah, in the bison range. Yeah, and some Cheyenne, they lived down here, and so they said, sure, we'll go with. And it was an informal reservation. And so that ended the peace completely. A three prong U.S. Army offensive, the biggest operation in the plains would be used. Basically what it's going to be from Bozeman and Missoula, from Fort Lincoln and from Fort Laramie. And they want to force the tribes to fight, defeat them and then force them on now a smaller reservation. And so the United States could now claim they're violating the treaty so we have no choice. Well, it's, as we know, much more complex than that. So part of this unit moving here was the Seventh Cavalry under regiment under the under the second in command, George Custer. The commander was off in the east uh, recruiting men. Well, when they got to here, their commander of this force, General named Terry, ordered Custer to try to find the tribes here. And the process of trying to find them, he stumbled across the biggest encampment they'd ever seen. 1676, that's his 16? 1876, June 25th, the Battle of Little Big Horn. So the Seventh Cavalry went on patrol and they found this massive encampment of thousands, much bigger than would ever be seen in the plains normally. Probably the second biggest grouping of uh, pl uh, American Indians on the plane since the Fort Laramie Treaty and that coming together to sign that. Just a huge group. And cut the two of the leading warriors, both Lakota, Sitting Bull actually was not really a fighter anymore. He had been too old. He's too old by then. He was more of a political, religious leader. A tireless fighter against the expansion of the United States. And one of the many leading wars, he was also, like, for example, at uh, during the Red Cloud War. This is a 
watercolor of of Crazy Horse. We don't know what he looked like. He never allowed his picture to be taken. As he would say many times, why do you want to steal my shadow? And I agree with him. I'm with him on that. And, but there are others, you know, and this massive encampment, much bigger than there'd be at least a thousand, perhaps even 1,500 to 2,000 people who could fight. Custer had a little bit over 400 men in his regiment. But Custer was worried that if he didn't attack right away, they would scatter. And so they, he divided his forces up into four parts and stumbled into an attack. It wasn't really a plan. Has anyone been to the battlefield? It's right near Hardin. One, anybody else? It's really well maintained. You get a good idea what happened, even though we, we have kind of changed our point of view through historical record of what happened in the battle. So a couple people been there. It's really pretty amazing. They did a great job. If you get a chance, go there. But I know one thing. We live in Montana. But it's a long ways away. Our state is massive. There are two really big battlefields. The other one is called the Big Hole Battlefield that are really well maintained. There's in spectacular areas, but it's such a big state. So Custer's plan was to attack, divide his forces up, and sweep this way while he brought 200 men around where the encampment was to capture women and children and take them hostage to force their surrender. That was a pretty common strategy. And kind of awful. Well, they were overwhelmed. And the over 200 men with him, almost half the forces that were with him and others would die in other places, would be killed, including Custer on one hill. A Lakota Sioux would later say it took enough time, this battle, a mini conjure of Lakota. It took enough time to fight this battle as it took to, for a hungry man to eat his dinner. Here are the cavalry laid out. It was just, most of them would be killed. A lot of the cavalry men probably also committed suicide rather than be taken prisoner. So it was a horrific fight. Here are the bones of some of the men after the battle. This is Custer here where most of the men died with him. Custer was killed probably relatively early in the last stand on that fight. And you can imagine the point of view of the Americans when they found, the United States when they found out. I should add, as soon as this battle ended, the tribes scattered. They couldn't maintain that massive encampment. A day and a half later, the rest of the U.S. Army arrived right about here. And eventually, it's going to take a while, by steamboat, eventually get to Bismarck, North Dakota, near Fort Abraham Lincoln, and then telegraph. So this June 25th, it's going to take a couple days, a few days. So what day did the news of this battle hit the newspapers in the East? July 4th. And that's 1876. Isn't that kind of a special July 4th? What do we call the 100th anniversary? That's the centennial celebration in the news of the biggest U.S. Army defeat since 1791. An absolutely humiliating disaster. And what did the people want? Revenge. And Grant will have to send more troops, and that will lead directly to, we're jumping right to here, the destruction of the city. Also the Cheyenne, but it was the destruction of Lakota Sioux. In a massive winter campaign, these are forces under Crook marching near General Crook, marching near the Black Hills. And they ran down each individual encampment or each individual tribe. They built many more forts across across uh, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota. At Fort Buford right here. Right here was a fort called, it's on the Tongue River in the Yellowstone. It's going to be called Fort Keogh. The commanding officer was a colonel by the name of uh, Nelson A. Miles. It's a little village. Grew up there named Miles Town, which became Miles City, and that's where I grew up. There's a fort that was created to stop, too, in this winter campaign. Eventually, City Bull fled to Canada for a while and then would come back. Crazy Horse and his encamp, his few followers were run down right here, and he was forced into the Pine Ridge Reservation. And then the army decided that we can't trust him and they're going to arrest him. And in the process, he was murdered. 
So we don't have any idea what crazy hills look like. So Mount Rushmore is here. Has anyone been to Mount Rushmore? A few people, got some black hills. Just south of Mount Rushmore, they started building the Crazy Horse Park. I remember going there when I was a little kid, and it was basically nothing more than just a big walk. Now it is starting to look like somebody. And they don't know exactly what it looked like, but it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular now. And there's some issues with destroying a mountain to make a carving, but still, I'm, I, I'm not going to lie. I like the Crazy Horse Monument. But this would be the end of the suit. They're going to be forced onto these reservations here, much smaller. And reservation life is going to be hell. It's going to be the first time for, on reservations, first time any of these tribal members are going to be hungry. Before, with the, when the bison were plenty, that didn't happen. Reservations would be miserable. And part of the reason they would be is because of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was supposed to run the reservation. They still are in charge. The reservations are self government now. Indian agents was the name given to the person in charge of the reservation. And they were known for corruption. A, a term for government corruption stemming from the government is graft. And we'll come back to that right after the break. That's a break semester test. It's not really a break, is it, if you have a test? Of course, you guys do get Monday off in the week after. So, <laughs> graft to steal it from the government. The Indian agents were infamous for getting the money that's supposed to go for food and shelter and pocketing it and giving either terrible food, limited food, or no food on the reservations. And also, or selling it to them along with cheap whiskey and to get them addicted and to destroy their life. By the mid-1880s, these reservations were nothing but just misery hunger, starvation, and think of the amount of grief. By 1888, most people on the reservation, in fact, they all had significantly more friends and relatives amongst the dead than the living. They must have just been miserable. In fact, George Armstrong Custer, before the Battle of Little Bighorn, he had been testifying. He was actually court-martialed for various reasons. Part of it was his criticism of Indian agents. And he testified in front of Congress saying that they are corrupt and cheating and they're going to lead to a revolt on the Lakota reservation. And he would try to be right. They're not going to stand for this. And that's going to lead to one of the most sad and tragic moments in American history. The ghost dance religion. Well, Volca, who a little bit earlier, 1887, 1888, he was a Paiute. And he had been actually raised in a missionary school. So you have a combination of Paiute religion and Christianity. Here's Wavolka right here. And his religion was, if you believe enough and do a special dance and work enough, we can go back to before, to before. So before the United States came, or as they would say before the whites came. And soon it would turn into the buffalo would come back. Your relatives would come back. And eventually there would be ghost dance shirts that would be made if you wear these special shirts. And it soon spread throughout the West in reservations. You, it gives you an idea how desperate and terrified the people were there. Why not? And people like City Bull thought it was garbage. When he came back, he thought it was garbage, but he said, do it. Or does it make the, does it make the Indian agents and the cavalry scared? And all of a sudden, word came back that this could be the beginning of another uprising, another attack on the reservation. It wasn't. They're done. It's over. The American Indians have been decisively destroyed. But here's an example of the dance. By the mid 18 or by the summer of 1889, it, it or uh, the summer of 19, 1890, it had died. The ghost dance religion was not. The biggest concentration of ghost dance religion, religion was on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and they had broken up. It was over. But Republican congressmen and the president in Washington, D.C., Benjamin Harrison, were worried that the Democrats were going to do really well in the next two elections. And they thought a way to help them do well was a war. And so 
because of political reasons, they help engineer a war by saying this is the beginning of a of an uprising. So Republicans have already made Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and the Dakota states for Republican control. Now they want to gin up a war. And so the first process was to arrest one of the leaders of the Lakota, who wasn't in support with the religion, but they arrested City Bull anyway. And in the process of arresting him, he was shot and murdered. And once he was killed, this will trigger chaos. All of a sudden, those poor, starving people on these reservations, especially the Standing Rock Reservation where City Bull was, they panicked. And this sad caravan, here's a painting of it, in the middle of December, begin to move south, or November, towards Pine Ridge, that reservation. And the U.S. Cavalry was sent out to stop it. The 7th Cavalry Regiment, the very same regiment that was humiliated at the Battle of Little Bighorn. And they stopped them right here. That's the cavalry going out at Wounded Knee, December 29th, 1890. The temperature was ranging between 15 and 30 degrees below zero. And so if you want, you can go out tomorrow and we'll experience that as you walk to school. Okay, we didn't quite finish this, we'll finish this tomorrow. Sound good? I hope it doesn't get 32 tomorrow. Okay. The coldest I've ever been was, the coldest I've ever been in sustained temperature was 55. Degrees. And it was windy. Never been, never seen anything like it. <laughs> it went off the windshield charts. That's all. And I was, that was a shock. That's when it, I got up to zero and it felt more like. So I'm checking the temperature. Hey, by the way, anyone hear about the, the uh, flood door, the exit door they call it, flood door came yeah, off on? Yeah. yeah. Guess guess what kind of plane I rode on? A Boeing 737 Max 9. And guess who was sitting in the exit row? You. Yeah. It was the Yes. Yes. But, but every, every Boeing plane, same one. They used to have one Boeing. That would have been a problem with that. But the problem is, if you're not going to follow that, it, it, the big problem is it's almost impossible to install it. Until it blows out. Yes. The person that's sitting there does. Yeah. So it's an advantage to the flood door it gets it pressurized better, it gets it fuel efficiency. I want all the involved. Oh, guess who was sitting right next to the door? Yeah. I love those snugs. All right, see you tomorrow. Oh, I still have seven and a half. Can you run faster? Yeah, okay, no, good, good. My yeah. uncle and um, my uncle. Bye, see you. I mean, your cousin started out with tech company for like two years software. Dude, like, like so. an Elon Musk. No, see you tomorrow. Oh, literally, I was missing lists. Oh. Go, go, leave. I know it's tough to leave here, but go. It's quiz day. Quiz day in the valley. Ooh. I've checked the camera. I think it's gone below zero, people. Oh, yeah, you know. Banana Bell. The monkeys are coming back. You're so Hey, Mr. Parchers, can we get a quick one on everything we've done in the last two weeks? Yeah, stuff. I gotta tell my wife that we. Samara, Costa Rica is 89 degrees, 93 degrees right now.
Helena, negative three for your dining and I would argue dancing entertainment. And the winds are supposed to pick up. That might be the best part. I lost everybody. Action paper number one. I'll tell you what. I was originally going to have 42 questions, but I'm only going to have 10. See, now you feel good, right? About 10. 10 sounds great. I want I don't know my box so we one of her sister. Oh, yeah, no, I like Because I like one. Any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Oh, horizontal vertical? Oh, no, what is it? No, Which one? Uh... The Central Pacific started here. The Union Pacific started. Any others? Any others? Oh, horizontal vertical integration. I'm trying to write questions for them, and every time I try to write a question, I was basically answering the question in the question. So those two will not be on the quiz. So those are two ones that will not be. So quick, we have quiz. Now, there's some of you who have not done the DBQ and I've done turning other things. I gave you opportunity to take them. If you didn't take them, I had to change the grade to zero. So you better talk to me. That's, that's 200 points. I also got 100% on this quiz. I did really well. I know. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Was he the alternating current? It's an AC. Even though he stole it from Tesla. No other questions? All right, one to ten. Begin. Oh, we're filming this still. Everyone take a bite of the camera. The pictures are up for dress up day. 